dismiss under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Okay, seeing none at this point, I want to make a few thank yous before... Can't hear. No. Did you hear anything? No. No. Go now. Okay, now? Now you can hear me? Boy, and it was so brilliant the first time I did. I don't know if I can replicate that. Welcome, members, council, staff. This is our first ever virtual Center Wellington Township Council meeting. Thanks to our town clerk. Thanks to Jeff from IT. Thanks to all our team for making this Zoom meeting possible and help making sure that we had everything that we needed from a council and staff perspective to get this off the ground. Recognize that we are currently in a declared state of emergency in Center Wellington. The agenda items on today's council meeting are the things that are time sensitive and the things that require council direction and attention. The other items that we had on our tracking sheet have not been forgotten and they will be considered in future council meetings once this emergency declaration has been lifted. So I just wanted to make that clear. And now I'll turn it over to our township clerk for our roll call. Okay, so I will unmute everyone. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Okay, we'll come back to him. Councilor Foster. Oh, I'm there now. Oh, okay. Councilor Foster present. Can you hear me? Yes. Councilor McElwain. Here. Councilor McRae. Here. Councilor Kittress. Present. Councilor Dunsmore. Here. And Mayor Linton. I'm here. Okay, thank you, Kerry. A little bit of an update. It's been a whirlwind month for all of us. The COVID-19 situation has preempted everything else that we thought our priorities were. And here's a little bit of, I wanted to provide members of the council with a little bit of a snapshot as to what's been going on at the township over the last few weeks. So as of yesterday, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph region, there's 31 cases in Dufferin County, 46 cases in the city of Guelph, and then 14 cases in Wellington County. But we do know there are more than the confirmed cases, so we do know that the virus is circulating unknowingly within our community, but that's what the official statistics are at this point right now. We are currently being advised by the Guelph, Wellington, Dufferin Public Health Unit. Dr. Mercer has personally participated in all of the meetings, the county meetings and the township meetings, from time to time to provide us with subject matter expertise to inform our decision making. So we're getting a lot of really good subject matter expertise from Dr. Mercer, so very thankful that we have access to her on some of our important calls. Important to note that in a state of emergency, the typical organizational structure for the township has been replaced by an emergency management structure. So I just wanted to let you know that there's three important meetings that are happening every day. The first meeting happens at 8.30 every morning is the County Emergency Operations Committee, so their EOC, and they meet on a conference call. As the warden, I'm the only member of council involved on this call. It's chaired by County CAO Scott Wilson and includes all the department heads, and that's the group that makes all the decisions for the county during a declared state of emergency. The second call that we have is a township emergency management team meeting, and that's the EMT for Center Wellington. And they use Skype, and they meet on a call every morning at 10 o'clock, and typically I'm the only member of council on that call, with the exception of Deputy Mayor Van Leeuwen when I have a conflict with this call. So the EMT meeting is chaired by our CAO Andy with the participation of the department heads, 
and other key functional area managers. So that's where the township decisions are being made at this time. The third call that we have every day is a countywide mayor CAO conference call every day at 1230. That includes the participation of the seven mayors and the seven CAOs, as well as the county CAO. This meeting is chaired by the county's emergency manager, Linda Dixon. And the purpose of this call is to discuss decisions made at both the county and the member municipality levels, and to do our best as seven municipalities to collaborate and be consistent, share our stories, and share what we're doing, and try to be as consistent in our decision making as we can be. So those are the three calls that are happening every day. So from 830, and then there's other calls that are coming up in between those calls, but those are the three standing calls that we have every day of the week. Before I go any further, I did want to take a minute to recognize our CAO and our township management team right now for their exceptional job of running our township during this pandemic situation. So thanks, Andy, for demonstrating excellent and decisive leadership through this time, and thanks for all the managers who effectively manage your department, your function, and your staff who are forced to adapt with the significant changes on a daily basis and make changes on the fly. I really appreciate all the leadership that you're providing to the town and our community at this time. We definitely couldn't do it without a really, really good team behind us. I also wanted to mention that the county emergency manager, Linda Dixon, has done a really excellent job of managing all the process and the systems. The importance of having a county-wide emergency manager has never been more obvious to its value. It's been really, really good. So Linda Dixon is on all those three calls that I mentioned, as well as making sure all the minutes and the action items are followed up on after all those calls. So the good thing is that that was all put into place long before we ever heard anything about COVID-19. So all the mock trials and all the things that we did leading up to this pandemic really, really paid off, and we knew how to set all these meetings up, and we knew how to document everything that we did. So that's really good, and that's being done in behind the scenes all the time. I know it's an awkward time for councillors because you're not as involved as normal, and I'll make sure that we communicate with council all the actions taken, decisions made during this emergency time, and these actions taken, decisions made will be accounted for. Once this emergency declaration has been lifted, there will be clear accountability back for everything that was, every action that was taken during this emergency period. Okay, so let's get down to business today. During this virtual meeting, we just have to make sure that the protocol is right because it's a little different than being face-to-face. I'll be asking for a mover and a seconder. Then for discussion, I'll go around the virtual council horseshoe, starting with Councillor Foster, then Councillor Van Leeuwen, then Councillor McElwain, Councillor Kittress, Councillor Dunsmore, and Councillor McRae. So we'll follow that process the whole way along. I'll give everybody the opportunity to speak once to every motion, and then we'll go around the virtual room again. If you don't have anything to say, you don't have to make something up, but that's the order that we'll do things in. I think we have to be a little bit more deliberate in a meeting like this to make sure that we get through the business of government today. After the discussion is done, when we vote, all voting will be verbal by indicating a yes or no. And again, for the voting, I'll go around the virtual room again in the same order. If a recorded vote is requested by a member of council, a verbal vote will be then conducted by the clerk or her designate. So I think our clerk is set up to do that, but our deputy clerk, Lisa, is also here as well. So I know we can count on your cooperation, your patience today as we try to get through our first ever Zoom call. So that's all my comments that I have. And the first thing we have to consider is that we can do this legally, and that means that we have to consider the electronic participation in council and committee meetings. And we have a report that was pulled together by our legislative services department, and our supervisor of customer service and deputy clerk, Lisa, has written that. Lisa, did you want to lay out the pieces of that report? Lisa, because Lisa's running the live stream, she can't participate verbally. So 
I can just give a quick overview. I think everybody is aware that the province passed Bill 187 on March the 19th, giving municipalities the authority to hold electronic meetings, provided they amended their procedural bylaws in a manner that allows for it. So this amendment before council now allows us to, during this emergency, to hold electronic meetings in open and closed meetings, and members will be counted towards the quorum. Okay. So what I suggest we do, we have the report in front of us. I'm going to read the recommendation, get a mover and a seconder, and then we'll go around the room in the order that we identified and see if there's any questions or comments from members of council. So the recommendation reads that the council of the township of Center Wellington authorize the mayor and municipal clerk to execute a bylaw to amend bylaw 2002-91, a bylaw to provide rules governing the proceedings of the council of the corporation of the township of Center Wellington and the conduct of meetings to allow for electronic participation in the meetings and for members participating electronically to count towards quorum. Can I have a mover for that recommendation? Councilor Dunsmore, seconded by. Councilor McElwain. Discussion. I'll start with Councilor Foster. Thank you, Mayor. I am generally in support of the motion. I think it's needed and it's essential. Can everyone hear me, just as a technical matter? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. My only concern, Mayor, is that we should have done this three or four weeks ago when the province gave us the right, almost roughly three and a half weeks ago we could have been doing this. That's my only comment, but I'm in favor of doing this. It's necessary. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Foster. Councilor Van Loon? Yeah, I'm in favor of this. Thank you. Councilor McElwain? Yeah, I'm in favor. I just have a question, though. There has been a couple of reports over the last few days that Zoom is open to hacking and it has been made. A few companies have said, no, they'll never use Zoom because it's hackable. Do we have a concern about that? Is there another platform we could be using or should be using? Yeah, and I'll mention something because I know the county had this discussion, too. If there was a closed portion to this council meeting today, I think we might have thought about it again. But I know that our IT manager, Jeff, has looked at this and he's comfortable with it. Dan, did you have anything to add to that? Thanks, Mayor Woodson. Yeah, Jeff has looked at this. He's confident in continuing forward for open sessions. And as you mentioned, if we need to determine a closed session, maybe we'll look at a different avenue. Councilor Dunsmore? Councilor Dunsmore, you're still muted. There. Now it's off. I'm for this motion. Councilor McRae? Get this. But I'm in favor of this motion. Is it my turn? I'm in favor of it, but I have some concerns about Schedule A, Item 8. It's not clear because of what was just described by the mayor of the procedures. It says here that we'll only be allowed to speak once. 
And so I'm just wondering, it's not exactly what the mayor said just right now. And I think that I'd like to make these recommendations on that is that the chairperson speak first since they're the one with the most knowledge and um, so they speak first. That questions should be, we should go around and ask questions uh, from the presentation first and then we should speak and then we should be allowed to respond. That's sort of how I feel that this should go and then we'll have a vote. Um, it doesn't say that there. The mayor indicated that just re just right now, kind of what that would be, but it doesn't say that in this Schedule A. Yeah, so the only difference there, I mean, the schedule, I just made it a little bit more um, deliberate. Um, the, in point eight says that uh, each member of council will be able to speak and then speak once and re respond after your name is called. Um, and then if there's any other questions, we'll allow that to happen. Uh, the only change I've made is we'll go in the same order so that it's clear. And if you don't have anything to say, then you don't have to say anything. So that's the way we'll do it for today. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that, that that's a problem because what you said before, um, you have an order, but you don't get to respond to the arguments or something that somebody says. So it's just like you just, there isn't really any debate or conversation about it. It's just, so how I'm suggesting we do it is that you present it, you say what it is, there's questions, and then we get to s speak, but we get to respond. And I think that would be much more democratic. And then we'll, somebody, then you can call to vote after that. If we're left with only one, then it's really not really a democratic meeting. It's just, everyone just gets one say. And that's not really, uh, what I would call, and these are the protocols. So this is what we're going to be doing for who knows how long. Um, so I think you have to get it right in the beginning. And that's sort of, I think there should be amendment made there. Any other thoughts related to that? Councilor Villa? Yeah, Council Van Leeuwen here. Um, so the way I read it, it says that each one of us get to speak once on it, and then there's an opportunity for to ask questions. It doesn't say there's only allowed one question allowed. I just want to confirm that that's what it says. For each item, the chair will call on each member of council to speak. All questions must be directed through the chair. The chair will ask if there are any additional questions. So we get to ask an additional after. Once all members have had been given the opportunity to speak, you're only to respond. So it kind of shows that we're going to, we're first going to speak on it, and then we're going to ask and have a discussion. Um, is that is that a proper reading of it? You can clarify. Yeah, that is a proper reading to it. I mean, it, the the slight change, and this is what Councillor Kitchens is talking about in the upfront uh, discussions. I suggested that we. Uh, do two rounds rather than going back and forth. Um, uh, what, what's really important to me is that there's equity in, in uh, allowing allowing uh, councillors to ask questions. So um, I will be going. I will be going in order in the order I suggested. And again, if you don't have anything to say, then um, then you just pass. Um, and if it seems like there's still a discussion happening, then I'll make the decision on whether we keep going in that in that order. All in favor? Kelly? Kelly? Yeah. Councillor uh, McElwain? Um, 
Stephen just ask a question there out of turn, so to speak. And that's kind of what Stephen Gittress is suggesting we should be doing, is not just going around the table to be able to ask our questions. And I think that what Stephen just did is the proper is the proper way to do it is he had a question, he put his hand up and asked the question, and I just did the same thing versus waiting until it was my turn to come around the table again. So I, I think that's what Stephen Kitchens is asking for, and and I think that makes a lot more sense. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for all the hand signals there. That helped out a lot. Um, I, <laughs> I think um, my suggestion, because this is a different uh, a different um, mechanism than we typically do at council, that is a chance to get real messy. So let's try to do it the way you guys have suggested. That well, if I see hands up, uh, we'll go. But I reserve the right um, if it's if it's going nowhere, and we're sitting here at this time at eight o'clock tonight um, to go back to my suggestion of going around the room. I was just trying to be efficient, given um, given the nature of a virtual call. Um, but uh, if everybody's okay with it, uh, I'll I'll try to do it. If I see hands go up, I'll try to I'll try to uh, be respond respond to that. But we are going in order for the first round of it, at least. Okay. With that, with that, um, uh, clerk. Through, through you, Mayor Litton. Just a reminder: we are not all on video. We do have a uh, a telephone caller, so. Your, the the visual is not perfect for for all members of council. And again, I was thinking that we might have two or three people on um, on just voice, so that's why I was suggesting it this way. Um, and that's why I think we should reserve the right to go back to this if required. Um, that being the case, and we'll try to do it a little bit more um, organically. And as I see the hands, I'll call them out. Are, is everybody in favor of this um, recommendation? All in favor? Uh, can we make a statement about this first? Because we haven't had that. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not following you. A statement about what? I would like to just say something about this before I vote. You, okay, that's what I thought I gave you the opportunity to do, but go ahead. Well, what I'd like to say is um, that this electronic meeting is pretty amazing because uh, I didn't think I'd be doing this. Uh, and uh, I think the technology allows for us to, to have meetings much more regularly because of this and it's a great opportunity to show that the technology has moved much more faster in advance than the legislation. This legislation is from 1990 and at that time this miracle wouldn't have happened. We didn't have that technology. We didn't have conferencing like this through diff different formats even. This is just one. And so uh, I'm for this, and I'm glad that we can uh, meet like this and uh, show the public that we are being responsible and we are doing our due diligence and responsibility. That's it. Kelly, may I speak? Foster. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just double checking. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, 
Mayor, I, I don't disagree with this motion, but I think what Councillor Kittress is talking about is just having a, a very formal structure that is reflected in these guidelines in, in or after item eight. That way we have a very clear pattern of going around the table uh, first to ask questions, uh, secondly to speak to it, and then a third round um, to uh, respond and then call the vote. I, I really do like that because it's orderly and logical and we follow the same process each time. And as you pointed out, Mayor, if you ha have no comments, you can simply pass. So I, I really do like it because it's logical and uh, it's the same each time. And so I, I'm, I am in favor of Councillor Kittress's uh, comments that they should be incorporated and shown in the appendix or the guidelines after item eight. Or item eight, it ought to be expanded. So it's very, very clear. Can we do that? Are we suggesting an amendment to this? Yes. And can somebody please, those, what, what you said and what Councillor Foster said were two different things. So can somebody uh, put forward an amendment that we can vote on, please? I would like to amend that item 8A be included to specify three rounds of discussion. So really all we're asking for, Kelly, is that it's stated clearly in the appendix. So for example, item 8A would be, as we've just described, a round for uh, uh, quite a uh, that you as chair would speak first, first round of questioning, second round to speak to the item, and third to speak and respond one last time and then the vote be called. So I'm, I'm suggesting an amendment to include item 8A as, as I've just described and be included on that appendix. So it's very, very clear what our electronic meeting process is going to be. I'm okay with everything there except that I speak first. I'll, I'll reserve the right to speak at the end. But uh, if you're okay with if, if you're okay with that uh, modification, then we'll ask for a seconder. You can always speak at the end. I do agree. Kelly, that with you speaking first, you, you do have the, the greatest amount of knowledge on the item, and it's a recommendation put forward by staff. Um, I think you do need to speak first. Okay, and we have a seconder for that then? Okay, Councillor Kitra seconded. Um, all, in all in favor of the amendment? Bob Foster in favor, yes. Okay, thanks, Councillor uh, Foster, for having that. Okay, can we put the hands up again? Should we record this? And that's carried. Did you get that, uh, Clerk? That was unanimous. Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, okay so that's passed. So now we're legal. Okay, moving on to uh, bylaws. Um, I have a recommendation that bylaws 2020-14 be read at first, second, and third time and pass signed by the mayor and clerk and the corporate seal affixed. Move for that recommendation. So Councilor moved, Mac Kelly. Councilor Foster, Councilor McWayne and seconded. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Uh, Presentations. I did my update already, so I'm not going to add anything else to that. Um, confirmation of the agenda. I have a recommendation that the Council of the Township of Center White can confirm the agenda for a special meeting held April 6, 2020. Move for that recommendation. Councilor Dunsmore, second by Councilor McRae. Any discussion about that? I have a point, Kelly, if I could. Yep, Councilor Foster. I think we need to reverse the order of 10-2 and 10-3. I think we need to deal with 10-3 first because it deals with uh, the impact of 10-3 is changing our revenue stream. And uh, I think we need to deal with that uh, 
more at the beginning, uh, before 10.2, for example. So I'd like to propose that we just do 10.1, uh, 10.3, and then 10.2, uh, because of the impact on our revenue of 10.3. Of Does anybody, does anybody have a problem with us shifting the order of that? Or just shake, shake your heads. Okay, everybody seems good with that, so we can do ten three first. Okay, all. Thank you, Mayor. All in favor? And that's carried. Uh, confirmation of the minutes. We have minutes from February 24th, 2020 and February the 18th, 2020. Recommendation of the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held February 18th, 2020 and the Council meeting held February 24th, 2020 be adopted as circulated. We were for that recommendation. Councillor McElwain, seconded by Councillor Dunsmore. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. No delegations today. And then consideration of reports, we'll do 10-3 um, first then. Uh, amendments to the interim tax lot levy bylaw, fees and charges bylaw. So we'll report from our Managing Director of Corporate Service and Services and Treasurers. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, this report is looking at um, amending two bylaws, the interim tax levy bylaw and the fees and charges bylaw. Uh, this is a result of uh, one of the first decisions made after declaring an emergency at the township level where um, the township of Centre Wellington and every other uh, municipality in Wellington County announced relief measures in the form of waiving penalties and interest on both taxation and water wastewater payments. Uh, for 2020 amounts for 60 days from the due date. Um, this is, uh, as I said earlier, relief measures that will help uh, both residents and businesses in Centre Wellington cope with the uh, impacts of COVID-19. Um, so talking first about the interim tax levy bylaw, this was um, passed by Council in uh, December of 2019. Um, it basically sets the tax due dates uh, for the first half of the year and the levy is based on half of uh, half of the prior year's levy. And this is a, a intermediary step that we use so that we can collect taxes in the first half of the year before we set final taxes, tax rates in, uh, in May. Uh, we do have two um, due dates that are impacted. Uh, March 31st that just passed was a non-residential and multi-residential due date. And uh, April 30th is an upcoming residential due date. Um, so what is being proposed through the amendments to this bylaw are to um, uh, waive penalties and interest on these uh, taxes for a period of 60 days on all 2020 amounts owing. Um, so that is the first bylaw amendment um, included in my report. The second uh, report, uh, second bylaw is respect to fees and charges and this is to deal with the water wastewater component of, of the revenue and deferring penalties and interest on water wastewater amounts for the same period of 60 days uh, um, for 2020 amounts owing. And we're also including in that uh, amendment um, the ability to waive NSF and return fund fees as well, just uh, so that we're not um, penalizing residents and, and business owners um, for not being able to pay their taxes or, or their water and wastewater rates, it's just their water and wastewater rates. Um, so we're asking for the ability to waive um, NSF fees um, going forward. Um, Centre Wellington Hydro does administer our water wastewater uh, revenue collections um, and we've been in communication with them in terms of the logistics of doing this and uh, they have uh, communicated back that they were willing to do this. Um, so in summary we have the interim tax levy bylaw waiving penalties and interest for a period of 60 days from the due date for 2020 amounts and we have the fees and charges bylaw amendment to waive penalties and interest on water wastewater amounts for a period of 60 days from the due date on 2020 amounts and to waive NSF and return fund fees. Uh, just another point to make before I conclude, um, this will deal with basically taxes owing for the first half of the year and uh, the 
bylaw to deal with taxes in the second half of the year will come in the form of the tax rate bylaw, which typically comes forward in, in May. Thanks, Dan, for uh, laying that out. Now, again, we're going to go in order uh, that I suggested. Councillor Foster first. Comments? Questions? Uh, thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple of points. So first of all, I want to speak in favour of uh, this motion because it's going to help our citizens meet their payments. It gives them some breathing space. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, I do want to point out a couple of things, and the first thing is is that we're de we're deferring revenue here, um, and that has an impact on our budget. When the revenue we expected to accrue in April the 30th, we're best case we're going to receive it 60 days later. That has a budgetary impact. The second thing I want to point out is, and we don't know this with um, any certainty, but we're probably going to have revenue that is written off. In other words, we're not. many people may not be able to pay their taxes, and so we're going to lose some revenue. A uh, huge, huge impact here. Um, you know, just by way of one example, uh, if you can't pay your taxes, you know, ultimately there will be a tax loss sale for your house. I'm wondering if we would proceed in that manner if and when we have citizens who don't uh, pay their taxes or simply not able to do so. Um, the third point I want to make, and just as one example, every week in hockey season we have three arenas. They're very busy. And I did a, just a very rough calculation from four in the afternoon till midnight uh, on three arenas and eight in the morning till midnight on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, because there's not very many uh, users during the school day, uh, that adds up to almost $50,000 a week in lost ice time. And so this is the kind of, of foregone revenue we're talking about. And, uh, and that's just for ice time. There's also the pool, uh, rental of our buildings, and most importantly, uh, potential for lost tax revenue and tax revenue deferred. So uh, I am supportive of 10-3, but I, I think council needs to recognize that there's going to be a huge budgetary impact on our municipality. Thank you, Kelly. That's Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in favor of 10-3 uh, um, and recognizing it's the a deferral of or of penalties. Um, I'm not sure if we have an amount of, of dollars that we actually collect in penalties, but it's not it's not the deferral of the entire amount. I, I do agree with Councillor Foster that we will receive our taxes later and possibly some hardships for sure. Um, but I, we, we do have a, a stepped process and when we are, are our revenues go out, I guess, or expenditures. So I am in favor of this, and I think that, uh, that it's a good step to allow people to get their feet under them in this uh, changing time quickly so that they can get back onto normal schedule later. Thank you. Councilor McLean? Thanks. Um, I'm in favor of uh, the deferral. I just, I, I have a question about um, if we're, you know, if we're within a two-month period, that may be enough. But if this extends any longer, um, do we have the power, the authority, to be able to declare businesses that have zero revenue coming in, declare their buildings to be non-occupied and a lower tax rate? For a period of time to to help alleviate the problem more so than just deferring taxes, um, they are never getting the revenue back. So the fact that they still have to pay the taxes at some point in the future doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And so lowering the taxes based upon the fact that the building is not being used is that a possibility? Um. I want to cover one, one comment. Firstly, we know this is a first step, and there might be other steps we have to take. 
But Dan, can you respond to that more specifically? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Linton. Through you, we are somewhat restricted in what we can do through the Municipal Act. There's a section of the Municipal Act that talks about bonusing and providing favoritism of one business over another business. So we need to be mindful of that in what we do. And there are some abilities in the Municipal Act to, for example, go through the CIP program or go through a grant program. But staff are looking into that. Just be mindful of the restrictions that we do have. Councilor Kittress? Thank you, Mayor. I am for this deferral. I have some concerns about getting all the information financially because it's one thing to defer it and not have the penalties and stuff like that. But if it's an extended period of time, I'm concerned that taxpayers are paying for services that they're never getting. And that means that we have taxed them. We're losing the revenues, as Councilor Foster said, for the facilities that we have. But we're also saying that the taxes that you're going to be deferred are paying for a service or something that you're not getting. And so I just sort of am a little bit concerned about this being just a first stage. I'm wondering when we, I'm asking Dan, when will we be meeting as a council to discuss other financial information and those reports? That's sort of my concern. There are so many pieces of information out there that say it's going to be soon and then it's deferred, you know, it's extended. And if it goes into June, July, that's a long period of time for having this fiscal information not being able to deliberate. So I'm just wondering when is the timeline and when's the schedule that we will be getting information again to decide on how this financial information will be going forward. That's all I know. Our CEO, Andy, wants to speak to that. Andy? Thanks, Marilyn. Thanks, Marilyn. We're working with the other municipalities as well as AMO and the MMH Municipality of Municipal Affairs on all of this. This is new territory for the provincial government as well as local municipalities. We are collecting the data with regards to how much money revenues we're losing and also looking at some forecasts, what that may look like if it's a couple of more months. So we're pulling that together, but we're also working with AMO and the ministry to, there's been discussions with regards to the impact of the Municipal Act, how that's going to be impacting the municipalities. We've talked about deferrals and extensions. So those are all things that the ministry, we've spoken to Minister Clark about that, and they've assured us that the Ministry of Municipal Affairs is going to be looking at all of those scenarios, including property sales beyond three years. So those are things we're waiting on some guidance also from the province with regards to the legislation that the province has. But staff are currently working on all the numbers with regards to lost revenue, deferral of taxes for penalties, and trying to pull that together and providing a couple of different scenarios with regards to one month, two months, three months. And so we're working on that as we're, as we're still trying to keep the operations working at this stage. So I don't have a specific timeline, but it is something that we're working on and we're hoping to have something in a shorter period than a longer period. I think to add to that, Andy, you raise a good point. We're not in this alone. So what the, what the federal government and the province does when it comes to our lost revenue, that's a huge piece of the puzzle. And we can't think that we're going to be able to just make decisions as Senator Wellington or the County Wellington for that matter, 
without um, without recognizing what the province is going to do come to the table and what the and what the feds are going to do to come to the table so um, hopefully there's so many unknowns right now um, and we're just trying to do the best job that we can um, in such an uncertain situation but um, that that connection back to the other orders of government is going to be critical Councillor Dunsmore Councillor Dunsmore, do you, you don't have that little mute there button? It goes. So let me ask a question before we go any further. Carrie, are you unmuting us or are we unmuting ourselves? Because it seems when I hit unmute, it, it goes back to being muted. So yeah. No, I'm not touching it. I'm waiting okay. for you. If you struggle, then I will I will push the button, but I'm not okay. I'm not doing anything. All right. So it's my computer. I'll smack it later. So I think I'm in the majority here as I listen to people comment that I am for this motion and uh, giving relief in the short term to our, our rate payers is, is the right thing to do. I know that at some point we're going to have to revisit the budget, but we need to wait until this thing is at least substantially over before we start ripping things open or we're going to end up ripping them open three and four times. So I think the federal government and the provincial government are, are uh, helping people and, and giving employers the opportunity to pay their staff. Um, Dan, the only question I have for you is I know there are a lot of us whose mortgage gets paid and the taxes get paid automatically off of the mortgage when the bank takes it. So there's a lot of tax money that will still come in. Do we know a percentage of the people who pay their taxes outside their mortgage payment from the bank and, and what kind of ratio is that? Dan? Uh, through Mayor Linton, we're, we're currently looking at um, – uh, those statistics and we'll get back to council on that um, as you said there's still going to be people paying their taxes um, by waiving penalties and interest where we're making it so that those who can pay their taxes can and those who cannot can wait up to 60 days without penalty and interest so we're hoping that we're still going to have the necessary cash flow come in and we're going to monitor cash flow very closely over the next 60 days just to make sure that we have the necessary funds coming in and uh but we, we don't have those stats at this point. We'll we'll get back to you on that. Councillor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, I'm in favor of this as the majority. Um, from my perspective, it's early days. You know, cautious steps uh, as we sort out the needs of our community versus uh, what finances we have available to us. So. I think we're all quite leery of what we're going to promise now versus what we'll be able to going forward. So I think this is a great first step. Okay, then uh, second round here. Anything to add, Councillor Foster? Thank you, uh, Mayor. I, I am in support of this because it will help our citizens, but I'm, I'm very, very concerned as I said, that our revenue is going to fall, we know that, um, and some revenue is going to get written off. And that means we're going to have less revenue and our expenses are going to continue. And that, in the long term, is a, a recipe for financial failure. And I do think we need to revisit our 2020 budget in light of the COVID uh, scenario because all our projections are out the window now and I think we need to uh, meet urgently and retable the 2020 budget. Nevertheless, I am in favor of this 60-day uh, deferral. Thank you, Councillor uh, Foster. Councillor Van Leeuwen, anything to add? Nothing new to add. Councillor McWayne, anything new? There. No, I don't have anything new to add. <laughs> Councillor Kittress? I was just, I have a question. Um, from what uh, Andy said and Dan that they're working on, when, when would we be able to look at these kind of budgetary financial numbers? Um, like, is there going to be a schedule and when can we expect that? That's a question. Andy? 
Yeah, given what we know right now, I can't commit to an exact date, uh, but we are pulling together some numbers, and as I mentioned, working with the ministry, uh, there's discussions with regards to what flexibility the municipality is going to have uh, with regards to the timing and as well as uh, so the tax relief issues. Um, so as soon as we hear further from AMO and the ministry, uh, then we'll be able to bring back uh, some information. But uh, right now we're collecting it based on per week uh, and looking at what those forecasts are. Uh, and so, but I can't commit to a time frame at this point. Councillor Dunsmore? Councillor McCray? Uh, nothing more to add. Third round, Councillor Foster? <laughs> I think Dan wanted to say something. Councillor Foster? Councillor Van Leeuwen? Nothing further to add, Kelly. Councillor Van Leeuwen? Councillor McQueen? Councillor Kittress? I think Dan wanted to say something. He had his hand up there. Yeah, I see that. Councillor Kittress? Councillor McCray? Uh, nothing to add. Okay. Anything to add, Dan? Uh, thanks, Mayor Linton. I was just going to point out that um, in order to collect taxes in the second half of the year, we do have to pass that tax rate bylaw, which typically happens near the end of May. Um, so I, I don't know if we'll have the necessary information to make all of the decisions at that point, but Regardless, we'll have to pass a bylaw by the end of May, and we may have to look at amending that bylaw once more information is, is final. So that gives a little bit of a time frame for us. Okay, I read the recommendation that the Council of the Township of Centre Wellington authorize the Mayor and Clerk to sign a bylaw amendment as follows. Amendment to the Interim Tax, by tax Levy Bylaw 2019-69 to waive penalties and interest for a period of 60 days from the due date on 2020 amounts. Amendment to the Fees and Charges Bylaw 2019-74 to waive penalties and interest on water and wastewater amounts for the period of 60 days from the due date on the 2020 amounts and to waive NSF and return fund fees. Move for that recommendation. So move, Kelly. Councillor Dunsmore, seconded by Councillor McCray. All in favor? Yes. And that's Carrie. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's really uh, good that this was something that was uh, recommendation that was also shared by all the seven municipalities so I think we're in good company and I think citizens and businesses will be happy with this first step anyway. Okay so now moving back to 10-1 emergency delegation of authority bylaw and we have our solicitor from CV Law uh, Kevin Thompson here. Um, welcome Kevin. Thank you for letting everyone hear me. Can you turn it up a little bit you're a little soft. As I'll just speak closer to the mic. Yeah, that's better, much better. Okay, so you have the report in front of you. Essentially, the, the bylaw that has been proposed uh, is an extraordinary delegation bylaw to give uh, the CAO um, powers that you wouldn't normally have during the period of uh, the state of emergency at the local level. Um, so as you know, both the uh, county and the township have declared states of emergency. Um, we don't know uh, how long it will last, and we don't know uh, what we might be into a month from now, two months from now, or, or longer. Um, and while we can meet right now via teleconference, we again don't know if this pandemic will get worse, uh, if there will be situations where there are technological limits on the ability of council to meet, uh, or if um, quorum would, might be lost during a meeting due to technical difficulties. Um, and so the purpose of this uh, extraordinary delegation bylaw is to give the CAO um, powers that uh, it wouldn't normally have to maintain operational level uh, matters within the township to ensure the day-to-day -day functioning of the township can continue um, so that there is um, smooth operations as much as, as we can continue smooth operations with uh, public facilities closed at this time. Um, so this, is, this bylaw was prepared uh, by comparing some uh, comparable municipalities, notably the city of Guelph. We looked at uh, the city of St. Catharines, both of which have recently passed similar bylaws. Um, we, we proposed sort of a hybrid of the two. Um, 
City of Guelph proposed broad powers to the CAO. The City of St. Catharines went a little bit further and actually gave the CAO power to do anything that council could do. That would include passing bylaws. We have not proposed that extreme delegation in this bylaw. We found a middle ground that we think is appropriate based on common practices around the province. It's important to note that there are things that are explicitly not delegated and cannot be delegated under the Municipal Act. So the power to appoint or remove an officer of the municipality cannot be delegated. The power to pass any bylaw dealing with taxation in general. The power to incorporate corporations, so that's municipal service corporations or subsidiary corporations of the township cannot be delegated. The power to adopt an official plan amendment or an official plan or a zoning bylaw under the Planning Act cannot be delegated. Generally, powers dealing with small businesses, bonusing municipal capital facilities, none of that can be delegated. Most things related to community improvement plans cannot be delegated as well. And of course, the power to in any way adopt or amend the budget of the township is not something that can be delegated. So those are explicitly listed in the Municipal Act as items that cannot be delegated. And just for greater certainty within the draft bylaw itself, Section 6 makes it clear that the delegated authority that's proposed through this draft does not permit the exercise of any matters that are precluded from delegation under the Act. So I'm certainly happy to take any questions from councillors on what's been proposed and the scope of this bylaw. Thanks very much, Kevin. So we'll go around again. Councillor Foster, questions, comments for Kevin? Questions only for First Kelly? Did I hear you correctly? No, you can questions for Kevin in particular. You have a chance to speak. Full chance to speak. Okay. I wish to speak against this recommendation for a number of reasons. First of all, I want to point out that the emergency legislation is an anachronism. That means it harkens back to a time many, many years ago, a time when we had no cell phones, a time when we didn't have Skype or good computers, and even a time when we really didn't have good teleconferencing capabilities. And part of the reason for a delegation in those days was that we couldn't communicate and meet electronically like we can today. I want to point out that the province has given us the right to meet electronically and virtually, and we have the means and the ability to meet as we're doing right now. And therefore, the recommendation is simply not required. I staunchly and firmly believe that in this state of emergency, all members of council need to be involved in our community and in all decision-making processes. And I think we need to meet on a frequent basis rather than delegate to the CAO. We all know we have a duty to provide oversight of the municipality. We have a duty to represent the public on matters regarding the municipality. And I really don't think we should be delegating that, given that we can meet frequently electronically as we're doing right now. So I'm opposed to the recommendation and very opposed to it. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Councillor Foster. Councillor Van Loon? Yeah. Okay. With this here delegation of authority, I just want to clarify. So we're looking at like subdivision agreements, and you still have to work within the budgetary alignment. That's correct. I'm just trying to see where some of the things where we can't meet, per se. So there's maybe a little bit of examples as to where the CAO may run into scenarios where we can't meet. It might help us to understand the document a little bit more, almost more of a little intro. What things would we run into, per se? It talks about protection of properties, different aspects like that. Some of them, I wonder, why are we struggling with 
subdivision agreements and things like that, which we've listed separately. Can we just have an example so I can understand and if I'm going to approve this, be happy with it? I think I'm going to make a comment first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kevin if you have a couple of scenarios that come to mind. This will give you an opportunity to think a little bit. We have to remember as counsel that when we have a counsel meeting, it's not just about turning on Zoom and we're good to go. There's significant work that goes into this meeting, significant work in report writing, significant work in doing counsel meetings. So the nature of doing this only for emergencies is to ensure that our CAO and our management team have the opportunity to respond to that emergency. And it's only within some very clear parameters, as Kevin mentioned in his report. So, Kevin, if you're able to provide a little scenario, specifically now that we have the capabilities of doing electronic meetings from time to time, I think that might answer Counselor Van Leeuwen's question. Thank you. I'm sure you know, Mr. Matt. The problem we have is that we don't really know the full extent of where this delegated power might need to be utilized. The township does have a delegation of authority bylaw, and it was passed in 2016, and there are about 24 enumerated powers that are delegated to the CAO, to the senior manager, to the clerk, to the treasurer, to deal with all manner of day-to-day operational aspects of the township. For example, data acquisition, IT licensing, site plan agreements, severance agreements, closures of roads. These are the day-to-day operational items that you foresee in the township. If we knew what this pandemic would hold for the township as we go through the next few months, we could try and enumerate specific powers that we are delegating. The problem is we don't know where we're going. We're in uncharted waters. And so rather than simply amending our delegation of authority bylaw to add a few extra things, such as subdivision agreement authority to execute, what we've done is provided sort of a blanket stopgap delegation so that if there are situations that arise where urgent, and I'm talking more immediate decisions need to be made, such as requests for mutual assistance from other county of Wellington, lower share municipalities, we have the ability and the flexibility to be nimble and to take action immediately where it's necessary, where it's not possible to reconvene a teleconference meeting, or where delays involve, even a 48-hour delay could be problematic in terms of an emergency response. That's the sole purpose of this bylaw. It's not meant to have impacts on the budget. It's not meant to allow for expenditures that exceed the budgets that have been allocated. It's meant to allow for rapid decision making and the authority to enter into contracts, procure goods and services, make requests for mutual assistance as needed to respond to a situation that's still unfolding and we don't know how it will play out over the next few months. So it's very difficult to give concrete examples of how I might see this being utilized. I'm speculating. Yes, sir, Michael? Thank you. I am against this, the way it is written at the moment. I think that we haven't, I think we should have been meeting for the last month instead of council not getting together. Finding out today for the first time that there are three meetings every day to discuss the activities of county and the municipality. I mean, that's the first time I've heard of that and I don't think council should be kept in the dark that long about something that's so important to our community. So I think we need to be meeting more, number one. Number two, the way it is written, I think it is too general. Councillor Van Leeuwen already mentioned the line about subdivision agreements and agreements for procurement of goods and services. Well, I can't imagine ever running into a situation where we can't call a council meeting in the time needed to get a subdivision agreement. So I think it's just too general. I mean, there are situations where if our CAO needs to deal with the province or the county and the rest of the municipalities to have some kind of a financial agreement, yes, that probably requires something that he can, you know, doesn't have time to get county or council altogether to vote on. But for day-to-day business, I just don't see it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Matt. This case will be submitted.
and so I don't agree with it the way it is written at the moment. Dr. Kittress? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have concerns about this. Uh, some of the concerns were expressed by uh, Councillor Foster and McElwain. Um, I I'm pretty amazed that we can meet like this to sort of say that like we couldn't have electronic meetings um, is and that wouldn't be in time. Um, under the procedural bylaws we have now, they can be called on a 24 hour notice. Um, and I just sort of feel like I am really actually, I didn't under, didn't know that you had been meeting every day with these three meetings. So that's totally, as Councilor McElwain had said, that wasn't clear to me. I don't think the public knew that. Um, and I think we should meet more often. I, I think that it's contrary to what um, this, th the thrust of this, I think some of the municipalities that decided that, you know, decided that really early in, in the pandemic and, and now it's later and I'm concerned that it's too broad. There's no timeline on it. Um, so theoretically, if they say it's longer or whenever the government says, uh, you know, social distancing or whatever is not allowed, maybe I've talked to doctors, they say it could be September, October. Uh, that's too long. And so I feel very strongly that we need to meet more often. Uh, it's shown that, and we need to show the citizens that we're, we're doing their, that's what they voted us for. We have the technology to do it. I don't, and when the technology fails, then we could decide to do this uh, delegation of powers, but it hasn't failed yet. And I doubt it is gonna fail because everyone is ramping it up and making it stronger and more available. Um, I'm also concerned that if we delegate this off, um, really we're kind of saying we're kind of non-essential <laughs> for uh, the municipality and we don't really need to have any oversight or accountability and you know there's people there's staff that have been laid off and there's citizens that have been laid off and we're going to be collecting full pay um, when we're, we're, we've delegated these powers away so I feel that we should have many more meetings and we should show, we should be a beacon of democracy and show all the other municipalities, hey, like this municipality believes in democracy, believes in the teamwork that we can get together and make decisions in a crisis. And we don't, aren't timid and we aren't afraid that, you know, we, we can't handle it. And that's sort of my views on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to as it is right now because there is no timeline and there's, it's too broad. Councilor Dunsmore? Yeah, now that I figured out how to unmute myself quickly. This is an emergency situation and it, I've written emergency procedures before and they have to be broad because there's no way that the seven of us can come up with every single crisis that may occur during this emergency. So if you give the broader scope and the CAO can act without getting us together, this meeting alone, I'm sure that Harry and Lisa spent a lot of time putting this together just in order for us to meet. And some decisions have to be made quicker. It's foolish to expect that the CAO has to get us all together to make those decisions. It's an emergency. You don't gather first responders on the front lawn and have a discussion before you run into an emergency. You have procedures in place. CAO is not going to open up subdivision agreements under the emergency bylaw and go in a completely different direction from where the township council has asked him to go. If he does, he'll be let go as soon as this emergency is over. We have to give him the authority to pivot in a crisis. We haven't even seen the brunt of this yet. It's still coming. 
and we're going to have to make decisions on the fly. And I think it's imperative that we give the CAO and the mayor the opportunity to do that. As far as the three meetings that the mayor has every day, I've been aware of that because I've listened to his updates on the radio station almost uh, daily, and he talks about these meetings. So I knew he was in these meetings. It's imperative we give the CAO the power to run this township when we, it takes too long for all of us to get together. Councillor McCray. Thank you, Mayor Lynn. Uh, I've heard a number of interesting comments for and against this. To share some of my own personal experiences, in terms of several months ago, I had my entire communication system go down, landline, internet. I was without any communications. I live in an area where I have sketchy cellular um, access. As a result, I was down for two and a half days before um, personnel were able to come and fix the problem. Sunday, I lost my system again. Fortunately, they were able to do it remotely. Otherwise, I would have had to wait until I was out of quarantine. So there's an example of one counselor who is not able to participate electronically. These systems can go down and will go down whenever. In terms of my concerns about this, uh, my initial concerns had to do with what emergency delegations of powers are excluded, and uh, Kevin listed those off, so I'm comfortable with that. I think the one thing we have to remember is that the public expects a timely response to ensure public safety and infrastructure integrity. The only way we can do that is with this document. And one of the things that I read in there, and it says stay right in here in section one is, council is unable to meet prior to such action being required. So that already states that where we can, council will be engaged to make the decision. And I just wanna quote what Kevin had written in his report. This delegation is intended to be used only where necessary or where council cannot meet regularly or where decisions must be made to protect the public interest that cannot wait until the next scheduled council meeting, even when teleconference meetings are utilized. So I think that's the gist of this, is this is allowing the CEO to continue if for some reasons we're not in a position to meet. So I see nothing wrong with this document. Second round, Councillor Foster, anything new to add? Thank you, Your Worship. Mayor Kelly, um, I've been listening closely to all comments. Um, Kevin has pointed out to us, and we all know this, that yes, it is an emergency, and yes, we are in uncharted waters. And for, for those reasons alone, uh, friends, we, we need to meet more frequently. I know that today is the first meeting we've had in six weeks. And we've had the ability to meet electronically for, I believe, four weeks. And, and um, I really do think that we need to be leading and meeting frequently. And I also, as I've already stated, we need to revisit the 2020 budget because of the huge impacts that COVID-19 is going to have on our municipality. And I do not believe we should delegate these things uh, to the CAO. We'll be abdicating our responsibility under the Municipal Act if we do that. And so, uh, Mayor Kelly, I would like to make a motion that Council meet virtually every Monday at 1 p.m. on a scheduled basis. And in addition, Council may meet at your call in addition to the above Mondays at, at the call of the Chair. And thirdly, that the 2020 budget be redrafted and retabled for council approval at the earliest opportunity. There's a motion on the on the floor. Um, I'm going. I'm not sure how to uh, handle that one, Councillor Foster. That's not at all what we're talking about right now. You've added three new pieces to this to this um, discussion. And the only way that this uh, virtual discussion is going to work is if we deal with the if we deal with the recommendation as as we see it. Otherwise, we're never going to get through this. Um, you've added three absolutely brand new things to the table in the second round um, of discussion, and I'd really like to handle um, this delegation bylaw first. So I'm going to call that out of order, um, and we're going to continue with discussing. Um, this item that's all that is that we're talking about right now it's on our agenda your worship may I speak no 
No, we're going to go to Councillor Van Leeuwen right now. Thank you, Mayor. So I think my mind is put at ease in regards to reading very, very carefully through the number one section in there, where it speaks to it that, as Councillor McRae stated, Council is unable to meet prior to such action being required. We've spoken about the fact that this is not something that is, we're not giving up meeting, we're not giving up reviewing future issues as Council. This is something that we're putting into place in those cases that it can't happen. So after reading through and having this conversation, I feel more comfortable with it. I think it's appropriate. And all the other issues we'll deal with as Council can meet. So I'm good. I'm in favor of this one. Thanks. Councillor McElwain? I still feel that it's too broad. As far as the statement about when Council can't meet, I guess the question is, who determines Council can't meet? I mean, Council can always meet if you give us time to do it. So there has to be somebody who determines that we need an answer today and not tomorrow. I don't know who determines that or how it's determined. So I'm not sure that that protects us to make the decisions that Council should be involved with. So I still think that we need to be aiming at more Council meetings, as has been mentioned a number of times, and that there are, that these, the policy as it is written right now is just too broad. And as I say, the one line in there that I keep going back to is including but not limited to subdivision agreements. I just can't see how subdivision agreements could ever be considered a item that can't wait for Council. So if we're limiting Council meetings to every six weeks, then okay, maybe, but hopefully that's not going to continue to happen. So that's my comments. Councilor Kittress? In this time of crisis, because of the pandemic, the 1990 Emergency Act, we are now faced with a decision. And I do not believe that we should be abdicating our elected representative powers for those things that have been stated. I strongly believe that this is the time that we need to show the citizens that elected us that democracy works well and better than autocracy. And that we have this amazing technology that we can meet and that we can show the public what we're doing and informing them. And we don't have to wait until after the emergency is over to tell them what is happening. And the legislation has not caught up with the technology. And so I believe that we should be meeting weekly. And I think that our forefathers would be very proud if we exerted our democratic responsibilities. I think that democratic leadership is what we need now in this crisis. And it's democratic teamwork in a real sense when the rubber hits the road. And I think that it's necessary at this time to have weekly meetings. And I'd like to motion that we have weekly meetings. And when we see fit that we do not, that is not sufficient, that we can readdress this issue. So I'd like to have weekly meetings and defer this decision until after the emergency is over. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kittress. Thank you, Councillor McQueen. The case just argued is submitted.
until it's not feasible anymore. And I'd like a recorded vote. First, I'd like a seconder on that, and I'd like a recorded vote. I'm calling that motion again out of order. We're going to deal with the motion that's on the agenda as it sits. I still want a recorded vote. We're not going to vote on it, so that's pretty easy. I want a recorded vote for the original one that you're not – that you say we have to do. Right, because it's on the agenda, that one? Yeah, no, we'll get a recorded vote for that. Councillor Dunsmore? Yeah, I agree we need a recorded vote on this. I'm just going to reiterate that I understand that the bylaw is broad because we can't possibly foresee every circumstance that comes up, but I have faith that the CAO and the senior management team are not going to reverse the entire course of the community and rip up subdivision agreements because there's an emergency bylaw in fact. I think they're wise enough to understand that their job here is to guide us through the COVID-19 crisis and to manage us through whatever comes their way, and they can't always take the time to gather counsel. If there's an opportunity to gather counsel, I would expect that they would do that, and they're not time sensitive. In the meantime, we have to give them the tools to pivot on a moment's notice in order to keep people's lives out of jeopardy. Councillor McCrae? Thank you, Marilyn. I guess from my perspective, I feel that in some way, counsel, we're amateurs in trying to deal with this sort of a crisis. Our senior staff have been trained to prepare for this sort of crisis, so I think we need to step aside and let the pros deal with it. We can have the regular scheduled meetings that we typically would have, but to have meetings every Monday takes the professionals away from focusing on dealing with the emergency because at the end of the day, what the public wants is to see that we're effectively dealing with the emergency in a timely manner, and to keep pulling counsel in and pulling our staff away from dealing with the details that they need to, I don't think is helpful. Okay, so I'm going to read the recommendation, and then I'll go around the room one more time in the same order. You can have your last comment and then indicate how you're voting on this one. I have a recommendation that the Council of the Township of Centre Lines can authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute a bylaw to delegate emergency powers to the Chief Administrative Officer during the state of emergency resulting from the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. I've never said that full out before. Moving for that recommendation, Councillor McRae, second by Councillor Dunsmore. Okay, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Mayor. We have a duty to provide oversight of the municipality, and we have a duty to represent the public, and we cannot do that if we don't meet. Furthermore, my motion and that of Councillor Kittress refers to meeting more frequently, and it refers directly to item 10.1, because if we do not delegate the authority, then we need to meet more frequently. So, Your Worship, with all due respect, on a point of order, my motion and neither was Councillor Kittress's motion out of order. It directly refers to item 10.1. As a chair of this meeting... In any case, I am opposed to item 10.1 for all of the above reasons, and I'd like to retable the motion that we meet weekly as an alternative to item 10.1. Your motion is still out of order. It doesn't deal with the agenda item. So, I understand that you are not in support of this agenda item. So, we'll move on to Councillor Van Loon. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. I'm in support of this, and especially because it does allow us to continue to meet, and I have no concerns with the CEO and how they'll act within this, because I know that Council will meet as much as possible. Can I make a recommendation that if there are motions that Councillors would like to make, that there is a process explained in order for them to put a motion on the table at a certain spot instead of partway through a discussion? So, they'd say if they want to make a motion for another meeting or notice a motion, but we seem to have them thrown right in the middle of other topics. So, maybe there's a possibility of explaining how that could come about. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Van Loon. Councillor Kittress, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council.
Okay, so let's um, let's go through this first, uh, Council Van Leeuwen, and then I wouldn't mind um, after we take the recorded vote on this item, I wouldn't mind a, a, a comment from our clerk to talk about um, best practice when it comes to a motion that is brought forward by a councillor that isn't on our agenda. If that's okay with you, uh, Carrie. Councillor McAvoy. No, I'm voting against it. Councillor Kitchen. No, I'm against this as it is right now. It's too broad and um, it doesn't have any timeline on it. And the motion that I made about meeting so that we can have transparency and accountability is still valid even though the mayor says it isn't. Um, I'm just against that and I think it shows some character of this meetings that we're having right now. Councillor uh, Dunsmore. There. Is it better? Okay. So I understand that this motion um, is controversial. We, in a time of crisis, we don't know what we're going to face. We can't possibly come up with all the scenarios. We have to give the CAO and the senior management team the opportunity to pivot, to hold them accountable when it's over. So I vote for this motion. Councillor McCray. Thank you, Mayor Linton. I vote in favor of this motion as well. I think it provides us the flexibility we need in times of emergency to ensure the public safety and integrity of our infrastructure comes first. Clerk, can you go through and do the official recorded vote, please? Yes, I can. Um, Councillor Van Leeuwen? Uh, I'm in favor. Uh, Council Foster. Largely opposed. Council McElwain. Opposed. Council McRae. In favor. Council Kittress. Opposed. Uh, Council Dunsmore. In favor. And Mayor Linton. In favor. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you, uh, Clerk. Moving on to 10.2, a request for tender Wellington Drive and Cuthbert Street water main construction. Uh, and I'll turn things over again to Dan. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, this tender um, is primarily focusing on the water main on Wellington Drive and Cuthbert Street, but also includes um, asphalt, storm sewer, wastewater, uh, sidewalk, concrete curb, and gutter. Um, and then part of this work relates to a service financing commitment agreement with uh, Heritage River Retirement Community Corporation as well. Um, so we have the tender with 22 registered plan takers, four firms submitted. Um, all four were reviewed by our engineering consultants, Triton Engineering. And uh, the lowest bid is from Drexler Construction Limited at a contract price of $1,126,305.50, which includes contingency, excludes HST. I've included a financial analysis in Appendix A, which shows that uh, from a tax, uh, tax supported perspective, which is the roads and drainage components of Wellington Drive and Cuthbert Street, we are under budget. Um, the developer proportion is also under budget um, on Wellington Drive, uh, but for the water components of both Wellington Drive and Cuthbert Street, we are over budget. Um, there would be a transfer needed from the water capital reserve to fund both overages, Wellington Drive in the amount of $9,161.50 and Cuthbert $46,469. Um, those would come from the water capital reserve. And uh, 
through discussions with infrastructure services, there is a small segment of road extending off of Wellington Drive known as Foot Crescent that is also proposed to be resurfaced as part of this contract, which would add $20,000 approximately to the contract price. So with that, we are recommending award to Drexler Construction and to provide the necessary funding from the Water Capital Reserve. Thank you, Dan. It's good to see that the project still can go underway, providing employment and keep the infrastructure moving along. Appreciate that report. Again, let's go around the room. Questions, comments, concerns from Council. Councillor Foster? Thank you, Mayor. Generally, I'm very in favor of rebuilding infrastructure, and I really like the fact that we have some, this is a good project and done by a good builder. My concern is, Dan, you pointed out that we may be under budget. That's true on this item. But my concern is that we know, we all know we're going to lose revenue as a municipality generally. We don't know how much, and we could lose a lot. And until we have a good and a holistic view of our finances, I think we need to have a moratorium on projects like this until we have a good look at our budget and the impact of COVID-19 on our budget. And for that reason only, I'm not supportive of awarding this tender. I don't know what our financial position is, and none of us really do. And we haven't even looked at it or estimated what our financial position is going to be. And for that reason alone, I think we should not award this tender. I don't, is there, I get your opinion there, Councillor Foster. Is there a question there, or should I just go on to Councillor Van Dyne? Is there a question for Dan or Andy? No, no questions. Okay. Councillor Van Dyne? Thank you. Yeah, first off, I'm happy to see that it was under budget and that we received even the tender quotes. I'm glad to see that four firms pick it up, or construction companies. At this point, I think it is essential that we do work towards continuing business as normal as much as possible so that we can say that we are moving when this COVID-19 thing begins to loosen up, that there are tenders out there that we are ready to go and that people have jobs so they can pay their tax bill. I think it's, if we go into a bit of a panic mode, I'm more concerned the opposite way, that we stall the economy over the other. So I'm in favor of this tender. I'm happy to see it got done, and I'd be excited to see people back in the construction jobs when it's ready. Thank you. Councillor McQueen? Thank you. I have similar concerns to Bob. Just, we don't know where we're going to end up. We've already got tenders awarded this year for, I don't know, about $4 million or something of that nature, and we add another million dollars here, and it starts to add up to real money that we may not have, depending upon how long this COVID issue hangs in there and how it impacts our taxes and how it impacts our OLG income and how it impacts gas tax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just don't know where we are, and until we have meetings to discuss the budget, I'm not sure that we should be awarding a lot more tenders of any sort. Councillor Kittress? Thank you, Mayor. I like that it's under budget, but I have concerns about the overall financial picture. I think it's disingenuous to say that you can't have a projected budget understanding. I got that from my business with the controller that I had very, very quickly so I could make decisions. And it's to say that it's more complicated and you can't do it. I'm sorry, you can give financial information. 
Um, I've suffered through three recessions. I know that, you know, when you don't do the right decisions in the beginning, I lost over $3 million in my first time. I didn't know how to respond. And I got better at it when I had went through other ones. And so I know you could say that we're not experts, but I am an expert at downturns. And I do have, and I have taken decisions and I get the right consultant information to make those decisions. And so I think that I'm tired of us, of people saying that we're not experts, that people believed in us, that people believed that we can have those foresight and that we can make those decisions. And so we should be meeting more often and we should be getting the financial information and it is available. It, you can do it very, very uh, uh, quickly. But if you're waiting for the decision from the municipal, from the province and the federal on what they're going to give us, no, you should be able to make those financial and those projections without them and then add the other ones when they come in. And so I have to say that I, even though this is coming in lower, than expected, I, I, I'm hesitant to, to okay it until we get that information. And I would like very much to get that information as we go on. And now that we've passed this one where we can um, okay the CAO on certain things and calling meetings and we haven't it's been ruled out of order to call meetings by the chair. Um, I am very concerned. Uh, the pattern here doesn't look good to me. Um, and so that is, uh, I can't, I need to hear everyone's views first before I say what, I, I, what my final vote will be. So that's sort of where I'm leaving it right now. But I think that that information can be given and we can make that decision. And whether this project should go through or not, I'd like to have more uh, feedback on that. Professor Dunsmore? Yeah, I'm gonna ask some questions to Dan. Uh, the money for this project was budgeted in, in this budget or, or the last budget, and it's mostly coming from uh, water and development fees. There's just the 200,000 that's tax supported, am I right? Dan? Uh, through Mayor Linton, um, the the road component of the of the project is a combination of of uh, general capital reserves and OLG funds from the 2020 budget as well as uh, 2019. So it's a culmination of, of the two budgets. Um, the water um, components are both from the water capital reserve, which is funded through water rates, and the developer is funding their own portion. Um, so in total. Um, it, we are awarding for $1.126 million, but we're looking at um, just over $300,000 that is considered tax supported. Okay. So in a, in a time like this where the economy has tanked, the way we're gonna come out of this, I think is gonna be through projects like these. I think you'll see we'll get help from the federal and provincial governments on this. And I think it's imperative that we at least keep the project moving forward. It. Uh, you know, is there anything that's, maybe Andy's the best one to ask this question, is there anything that you can see uh, through the COVID-19 crisis that may actually pause this from uh, from beginning? Andy? Uh, thanks, you're through uh, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Dunsmore, uh, our reserves in both of these areas for water and wastewater are very healthy. Uh, we are seeing increased uses in water uh, through the COVID, so it is actually one of our additional revenue streams. And uh, the mayor and I can both explain, uh, tell you that in our conversations with the provincial and federal governments, uh, this is something that they're looking for municipalities to continue with. It is why it's one of the essential services still listed on the provincial list, is that they do are going to be looking to the municipalities to um, be kind of the restarter of the economy by doing these types of projects. Yep, and I think it's imperative that we vote for it and, and keep the economy going locally. Councilor McCray. 
Thank you, Marilyn. Um, everyone's raised some very valid points. Um, my own perspective on this is that I think we need to continue. It's business as usual. I mean, it's early days, so we will have time to reassess our budget to see what we can and cannot spend going forward. But this is a project that I'm in favor of proceeding with. Also, too, it addresses the concerns of parents dropping their children off at St. Mary's School in terms of I've received complaints about how unsafe it is along Wellington Street in terms of being able to pull off to the side and safely drop your children off. The proposed changes to this street will include drop-off parking areas for parents to let their children go and it will also include sidewalks which currently don't exist so children will have a safe route to school. So I'm certainly in favor of this proceeding. Well, thanks. I'm going to go around. Um, I'm going to read the recommendation in a second and go around the room and you can give your final thoughts and your vote on this matter as well. Um, I just wanted to echo Councillor McRae's uh, comments. Um, this has been something, a project that's been on on the radar for a long time now and something that's absolutely needed from a safety perspective. I know St. Mary's School um, will really, and the principal there and all the teachers and all the families there will really value this. It'll make it a drop off for the school a lot safer. safer. On following up on some of Andy's comments, um, we have received pretty, pretty clear direction um, through our Roma um, uh, re representative, uh, Councillor Mayor Chris White, um, and they've indicated to us that um, the direction that they're giving municipalities is make sure that whatever you do, you keep your projects on the book going um, because we're going to really be looking at the municipalities to kickstart our, our economy um, moving forward. So they've, they've been, there's some pretty strong indications from the province that they're going to be um, putting a significant amount of money into infrastructure and we should be ready for it. Uh, because they want to uh, prime the pump um, and make sure that they're using municipalities to get this economy moving again. So I think we're in a great shape. We have a great team and we have projects on the books and we have a really good 10-year uh, capital forecast. So I don't think now is the time to panic. Now is not the time to uh, kind of freak out on, th on things. I think now is the time. If we have a project that comes in around the budget and it's been something that's been in the books for a long time and it's going to bring a lot of good benefits to um, – citizens in Southern Wellington, in this case uh, to uh, Elora, I think we should move ahead on it. So um, I'm excited to see this project finally uh, come into fruition. I'm excited to see the final uh, final product here for sure. Uh, final uh, final comments and vote, Councillor Foster. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I have read in the paper and uh, getting reports that the province of Newfoundland and the province of Alberta are approaching bankruptcy. I note that the city of Stockton, California did go bankrupt, so, tid, so too did the city of Detroit. My view is that spending money we do not have or that is uncertain is a, is a recipe for a potential financial failure. We know, uh, Mayor, you mentioned OLG. Uh, we know that the revenue from the OLG is going to fall. People can't even get in the place to gamble. We have deferred our tax revenue. We are deferring our sewer and, and water revenue, and many of our residents aren't going to be able to pay their taxes and their sewer and water bills in 60 days in any case. So we, what we can conclude is that revenue is going to fall. Now, this is not panic, and this is not freaking out. And my view is that spending uncertain revenue is, is a recipe for financial failure. And I do like to update our infrastructure, but I do think we should defer this item until we revisit our budget. We need to do a better job planning uh, as a result of COVID, and we haven't even looked at our, our 2020 budget. It, it needs a, a redo. There's no doubt in my mind. We've got to look at our budget. We've got to look at our anticipated revenue, and we've got to look at our capital spending because we're going to lose revenue. And I do think we need to meet more often, and if we were doing that, we would have had by now a full assessment of our budget. And had we done so, we would have been able to make a better decision on this item. So I, I reluctantly vote against it, not because I don't like doing the infrastructure. I vote against it because 
I, I think we could have some financial problems ahead, and we are definitely losing revenue ahead. And we're not being uh, good stewards of the public money uh, by voting on this item, given what's going on with COVID. Thank you. I give it a, I vote against it, Kelly. Dr. Van Leeuwen? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I do think that um, there was a, a key piece here. Most of these funds are coming from reserves at this point, so we've collected the funding. Um, we've got developer contributions as well. Um, I, I definitely really want to make sure that, that we don't stall this economy, that we recognize that we have um, to deal with this COVID-19. We have to uh, be safe with it, but recognizing that there will be an end. Um, I don't want to have a self-fulfilling prophecy per se of, of stalling the economy by pulling everything back. Um, this is one of the projects that we have that is pretty much ready to go funding wise. Um, that being said, I do I do know and expect that that staff will look at certain projects and recommend uh, one way or the other in the future. But on this particular project, um, I am in favor of moving forward. Thank you. Councillor McQueen. Um, this project has been in discussion since um, well for years now and, and is required and I hate to, hate to defer it and end up costing a whole lot more in another year so for that reason I'm for it I'm still against it because um, I guess we, we've you know, kill this topic by this point, but we haven't had any meetings for six weeks and we still seem to be very negative about having extra meetings and discussing the budget and et cetera, et cetera. And I do think that's required. I mean, we are going to be making decisions that are potentially going to put our township in deep financial problems. And, uh, and this could be one of them, but I'm, I will trust that before we make any more large tender decisions that we will actually have some meetings and have budget discussions and I will vote in favor of this one. Councillor Kittress. Um, after we're uh, listening to everybody, um, I think that uh, at this time, uh, going ahead with this, because we have all the monies there, and uh, we are under budget on this estimate, I think that we're, it'll be a good idea um, to go ahead. But having said that, um, I, I really, everyone says we're, we're all transparent, we're all account, but there's been, this meeting has been very revealing in the reluctance to have meetings, reluctance to have any financial information given to us, reluctance to want to have a new review of budgets and stuff like that. So uh, even though I think this project should go ahead, um, I'm quite wary and concerned as an elected representative on the, the process that has been and, and the, the conversation that we've had here and the reluctance to have these meetings and to even to inform the public and we can be uh, informed about these financial things. Councillor Dunsmore? I was happy with the answers that Andy and Dan gave me and that um, I believe there's money there that's put aside, and this is the kind of thing we should be investing in to keep the local economy going. So my vote is for. Councillor McCray. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, my vote is for, uh, for reasons I've already um, discussed. Also, the fact that the money's already sitting there, it's under budget. We want to continue to have business as usual, so I think, yes, let's proceed with this. I disagree with uh, Councillor Kittress's comments about 
Uh, the fact that there's a reluctance to have meetings or to discuss budget, I think those things will happen as they should. In the meantime, let's get on with business. Okay, I read the recommendation that the Council of the Township Center Wellington award request for tender number 4 20 regarding Wellington Drive and Cuthbert Street Water Main Construction Laura to Drexler Construction Limited at the contract price of $1,126,305.50, including contingency and excluding HST, and that the funding for the project be revised as outlined in report COR 2020 20, dated April 6, 2020 and that the 20,000 in excess tax support funded for this project be allocated to pave foot crescent representing a scope of work increase for the contract. Moving for that, uh, moving for that recommendation, Councilor McCray, seconded by Councilor Dunsmore, all in favor? Opposed? I'm and opposed, that, Kelly. Okay, and that's carried. Okay, thank you very much. That gets past the reports. Moving on to information items, we have two items there. One's the treasurer statement on 2019 council and committee remuneration and expenses. Um, any questions from council for for that report that was pulled together by our, our treasurer? Okay, um, the second one is the treasurer's annual statement, 2019 development charge reserve funds. Any question for uh, Dan on that report? Okay, uh, moving on to 12 uh, bylaws. I have a recommendation that bylaws 2020-15 through 2020-17 be read a first, second, and third time and passed, signed by the mayor and clerk and the corporate seal affixed. Move for that bylaw. Councilor McCray, seconded by Councilor Dunsmore. All in favor? Opposed? Opposed. And Opposed, that, Kelly. And that's carried. Uh, confirmatory bylaw, a bylaw to confirm the actions of council, recommendation of bylaw 2020-18 to confirm the proceedings of council at the meeting held April 6, 2020. Again, introduce the first, second, and third time and pass an open council. Move for that confirmatory bylaw, Councillor Van Leeuwen, seconded by Councillor McCray. All in favor? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Kittra, seconded by Councillor McQuain. All in favor? Yes. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. First uh, virtual meeting out of the way. And have a great uh, rest of the afternoon.